later. Um, all right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, if I fall asleep standing here, um, I'll jet lag. So I'll try not to fall asleep while standing up. Um, my name's Carsten, or most people actually call me Rasta because no one has any idea how to pronounce or spell my actual name. Um, I work for Samsung um, in Korea in headquarters and I work on one of these little things called Tizen um, that we're in this room specifically for. And I've been working with Samsung in total now for about three and a half years. Um, two of those years was full time actually being in Korea. And I work on graphics stuff, um, specifically the lower end parts of the display pipeline. Um, which would be toolkit, rendering, not the OpenGL level, but just above that, um, window manager and a few other things in that direction. So one of the things that we are using in Tizen for the back end of rendering widgets, toolkits, is a library or libraries collectively known as EFL. EFL stands for Enlightenment Foundation Libraries. Yes, it's very unimaginative. Um, and a lot of people have the view that EFL is really only one thing, where it's actually a very large collection. Um, they happen to come from the same people working on Enlightenment. Everyone keeps asking, why wasn't it released? It's because we've been working on the actual libraries for many, many years. Um, we've been polishing the APIs polishing internal code, optimizing, making things work better. Um, and things have finally gotten into a, a pretty polished state. And they did last year, about the beginning, and we released 1.0 of most of the libraries. They're mostly focused on being lean, mean, and small. A little story. Way back when, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, um, I actually lived here in California. I worked for a company called VA Linux. Some might know who that, who that is. The whole stock market went bum up about 2001 or so. Um, everyone was busy, I pretty much let go. But at about that same time, I noticed these new little things that Compaq created called IPAC. And some crazy guys at, at, at Compaq, like the Jim Gettys and Keith Packard, they ported this thing called Linux, which I was working on, to this IPAC. And I just looked at that and I went, that's the future. That's where things are going to go. And as of that day, I focused on making Enlightenment something that would run on these things. Along the way, just naturally, Enlightenment creates libraries because it could all be in one big monolithic process. But making a shared library means you actually can share your work with somebody else as opposed to hoarding it inside one big process. And in the process of making those libraries, since a focus was to be able to run on these devices, we tried to keep them small, lean, mean, and efficient. At that time, any one of these devices with a GPU would have been laughable. No one would even consider doing that. And even in that time, rendering with OpenGL with a GPU was a pretty ridiculous thing. I'd been experimenting with it for quite a while. It's very hard to get it working well. So ever since then, a lot of this work has been gone into making EFL, making it work on desktop, but always keeping in mind, have it run on small devices with small memory footprints, not much CPU, not much or no GPU, etc. So just as an indicator of how big code is, only 26% of the active code in SVN is actually the window manager. The rest is for the libraries. And that's only about half the code in all of the repository. Um, there's all sorts of extra stuff there. So a quick history. Enlightenment actually is quite old. It started in 1996. Um, been going for a very long time. Back then, it was really just a window manager, which then started adding little libraries like imlib and the font library. And then that became imlib2, which got thrown away and changed for actually being EFL. Imlib 2 was kind of part of EFL for a while and was deprecated out of it. And so by today, you can see that 
only a small amount of the code is actually Enlightenment. Most of it is libraries that we work on. So in 96, when I was a crazy university student and had nothing better to do with my time other than spend it in the laboratories writing window managers, as obviously everyone does um, in university, because it's fun. Um, that's where I started writing Enlightenment. Then imaging layers got added because libxpm, frankly, was a bit of a joke. Um, it wasn't really that usable. Um, it didn't handle true color. It didn't handle color reduction very well, etc. Um, there was GTK, GDK support added to Imlib 2 in about 97 um, to help out the GNOME project. Uh, in 99, I rewrote Imlib to make Imlib 2, where finally we had alpha channels and you know, by smooth scaling and rotation and anti-alias fonts and everything else as well. Um, but of course, in using Imlib2, as I was writing more and more with it, I started writing a file manager, um, using the Imlib2 to do all the rendering, I discovered I was more and more creating what is a scene graph inside my application. And it is honestly lots of footwork to have to go and manage that scene graph yourself um, all the time. So eventually I went, oh, this would be much more useful if it was already put in a library that could be shared. Because the more and more UIs I made, the more I saw that they just were scene graphs. That's what the UI really was. So Evis emerged as a way of, one, implementing a scene graph, and two, implementing an abstraction layer at the point where it's very easy to redirect that via OpenGL for hardware rendering or via software, where the layer is actually very, very high, not very low. And your life gets a lot easier in trying to do optimization. Um, when you move that layer up. So over time, we also added more libraries. Um, Ebits appeared and disappeared and were replaced by Edge after some experience. EDB was actually replaced by EAT at some point. Um, there's a whole bunch of others there. I really don't have to name them. Um, but they each and every one of them have a very specific purpose in life. So inside EFL, we have many different bits of functionality covered by the libraries. Evis is the scene graph library and rendering abstraction layer high up. Um, there is no reason why it can't use things like Cairo. We did actually have a Cairo engine for a while. Unfortunately, I stopped working on it because it unfortunately was a factor of 20 times slower than Evis' software renderer and I didn't see a point of keeping working on it. But we can always bring that back if ever it's needed. Um, there's a full software rendering stack, so it works anywhere. If you have a CPU, it works. If you don't have a CPU, you're probably not using EFL or Linux. Um, the OpenGL supports both OpenGL ES and Desktop GL. Um, it's all shader-based GLSL, so it's OpenGL ES2, um, or better, and similar on desktop. That means you need the um, GLSL shader support in GL2. We have a main loop library, um, partly because to improve the main loop abstraction. For example, not use timeouts or timers for animation, actually create a single animation infrastructure that everyone shares to make sure frames are updated and rendered at exactly the same time um, in sync with each other. Uh, this makes animations smoother, um, more consistent, and it actually reduces the amount of rendering you have to do. It actually is a performance increase. There's a whole library for encoding and decoding data. Um, Edge is totally built on this. Um, a whole bytecode VM. This actually originally comes from small or porn, as it's called today, P-A-W-N. Um, and it is actually, and that originates from a project that started off as a C interpreter. It literally would take C source and interpret it. Um, it got simplified and gained itself a VM. Um, Edge is Layout engine, and we've got three decibel standard support, um, just you know, all data structures, modules, there's dbus integration, we actually support conman, um, there's even sort of for blues, there's a library API to support that. Um, so it talks dbus underneath, and on top is just a normal C library API. Um, there's even one for Ophono um, as well, and for HAL, and for UKIT. Um, as well. So, 
where there's an asynchronous I.O. library, there's a video playback engine, which is actually kind of interesting in that it becomes trivially easy to stick video on your screen and not have to worry about any performance issues. For example, you don't have to worry about finding a fast pass. You go stick in your canvas and everything else is handled for you. Um, you can go take that video and rotate it by 35 degrees and alpha blend it into something else and it just works. Um, it'll also work with both software rendering and OpenGL. And interestingly enough, actually, it's fast enough with software rendering to play full 1080p video even on this laptop here, which only has two cores, um, 1.7 gigahertz, and it'll actually work um, without a problem. So thumbnailing, and of course, one of the more interesting things elementary that gives us all the widgets. Um, unlike projects like Qt, which are a single library that's very monolithic with everything in that library, or GTK, which is less monolithic but more monolithic, where you have a widget set and goes all the way down to doing the rendering, in EFL, things are split in much more fine-grained layers and separate libraries. So elementary just implements widgets and policy. It does not implement all the rendering and the theming and everything else itself. They're done by other libraries that are pulled in and other systems. So we are actually adding more stuff all the time, um, partly due to demand, partly due to things that are interesting um, and hopefully solve other things in the future. One of the things we've been working on is something called Elevate. Um, it's definitely not complete, but it actually works. Um, it uses libv8. Um, it's a JavaScript engine. And as of very recently, we're also looking at integrating with Node.js. Um, we've actually now got some work that integrates our main loops, like eCore and the libvu stuff that's in Node.js. Um, so it means we can actually use Node.js plugins and modules directly in Elevate. Um, and we're figuring out how to make these two things work together. Um, but otherwise, both Node.js and, and Elevate are very, very similar. They all run mainlets, they're all event-based, um, and so on. So we've been reaching out to Node.js developers, and they've been actually quite positive. Um, we're improving object models. Yes, I know. Um, everyone wants to have their own object model these days. Um, we have looked at G-Object, but we're actually implementing something that's more of a hybrid between classical um, object structures and something a bit more dynamic like JavaScript or Lua um, or Python. So it's a kind of a hybrid model in between that we're implementing on top of C um, that makes li our lives much easier in implementing our libraries. Um, we're improving performance all the time. We're trying, um, adding more threading support, and we're always trying to decrease memory footprint wherever we can. So why does anyone care about EFL other than a few crazy nuts who work on it? Um, well, those crazy nuts who work on it are like it because they're crazy. Um, but EFL is being used in Tizen because it was built for low memory footprint, built for efficiency and speed, so it could run on these devices. It happens to have all its development done mostly on desktops and laptops. But that also means that, for example, Enlightenment, when it uses EFL, actually ends up being one of these minimalist window managers in terms of footprint, but actually adds a whole big bunch of features that has like vaguely feature parity equal to or even above what XFC is um, and getting towards what GNOME and KD have in many areas um, without having the footprint. So, EFL is also all open. All development is done in open. We never do it in closed doors. Every bit of code we do as we do it, um, or as it compiles and begins to actually work, um, goes straight into SVN. Um, like and Tizen is also going to be an open project. If you are putting native applications on Tizen, for example, you are creating a product and you're adding your own native UIs and tools, um, you can use EFL as opposed to adding another toolkit that you have to then integrate into the platform, look and feel and behavior and everything else. Um, it means that your footprint will be smaller because it's a, all the support's already included, and it means that as Tizen evolves, the support will continue. It provides almost everything you need. Um, again, it is not a 
single library meant to do everything on the planet? It's a collection of libraries, each one solving a problem. If DFL doesn't have that, maybe there's another library you can just use to solve that problem for you, and it's actually meant to be used that way. So use it and mix and match your libraries as you see fit and what you need. Um, all the APIs are in C, um, so you can use them from both C, C++, from D, from almost anything that has C API support, um, which is almost everything somewhere. So within the nice little box thing, EFL sits about there um, in the stack. So in the middle, um, the browser uses EFL, sits on top of it. It does do a lot of rendering itself. Um, it also uses EFL to manage its rendering and use a compositing layer there. Um, EFL itself looks a bit like that box-wise. Um, with elementary lurking on top of everything and gluing a lot of stuff together into policy and widgets and all the other library things being underneath, implementing different layers and different vertical stacks or vertical features. So for example, motion implementing video, um, edge implementing layout and animation, um, et cetera. Um, so why use EFL? Well, a little story. Um, when I started working with Samsung, I got a mysterious email from someone called Sokje Jong going, hey, hey, we need some help with, with like EFL. And I went, huh, what? Um, and interestingly enough, Samsung had been quietly in the background experimenting with EFL after having used GTK. And what they found is that EFL was actually significantly faster than GTK with a much lower memory footprint. They were unable to produce a real workable UI on their sample phones at the time. Um, whereas EFL out of the box with no optimization effort produced a smooth, silky smooth UI on exactly the same piece of hardware where they're unable to achieve that before. And ever since, they really, really liked it because it solved problems. Um, it, it wasn't incredibly fancy. It didn't have beautiful, you know, um, didn't have any marketing. No one marketed it. Um, it didn't have amazing documentation. It was pretty sparse, um, but it solved the problem. So at the time, they were actually using GTK either directly on the frame buffer via X or they were even using DirectFB at the time. Um, they even asked Doc, um, the guy who wrote DirectFB, to write a, an accelerated driver for them for their hardware. And ESL still beats DirectFB without using any acceleration. Um, so it just, it solves problems. And that's the real reason. And these days, since we now have GPUs on all our hardware, or on most of it, it also solves the problem of you write your application and it just magically starts getting accelerated via OpenGL and you change zero code. Um, it just magically works. And you don't have to know or care. Um, and if in future we wish to start using things like OpenCL to accelerate other bits, it just magically works. Um, you don't need to know or care. Memory footprint wise, using EFL helps. Admittedly, partly, even, this is not entirely EFL, it's also partly Enlightenment itself, but a Ubuntu install, the memory footprint of Unity, which is now Ubuntu's favorite compositor and window manager and display, is about 168 meg. Enlightenment, with all about the same set of features, compositing, um, all the launches, file manager, everything else, at 65 meg. Um, so you basically save over 100 meg of RAM um, just by changing environment. If you have four gigabytes of memory, who cares? But here comes the rub. The rub comes when you have embedded devices, phones, tablets, and these things don't come with 4 gig of RAM. They come with 128, 256, maybe 512 meg. Sure, it's expanding, um, but they really have lower footprints. These devices also don't have a luxury of swap. Swap is not something that you generally can do very well on a device with storage that has a limited number of write cycles. 
so you're more likely to cause damage to your hardware eventually if you start using swaps than if you don't use it at all. So you don't have that luxury to go off into swap land. So you have to make sure things stay in memory if you can. A lot of low-end devices, things like cheap MP3 players and stuff like that, they often don't even have a GPU. They use cheap versions of SOCs that only have a CPU and some very limited, maybe, um, video codec decoding support. And then you do have to render all in software. Um, it's one of those cost-cutting measures. It's reality, and people do it. But you can still render there and render well because you don't require OpenGL. Also, it's quite often that using OpenGL actually has a lot of overhead um, in using it. And it doesn't always give you a benefit. There are, in fact, many times when rendering software is actually quite a lot faster than rendering OpenGL due to overhead. So if you want to have a look at EFL, there is already a source code repository for Tizen available. There are Git trees there for EFL, although they actually are slightly older copies of the upstream SVN source. You can play with the Tizen installation in the emulator um, that's there. Everything you see is being rendered via something with EFL. Um, so you can poke around and have a look. Some distributions use EFL and Enlightenment. Um, there's distributions like Bodhi Linux, which is a variant of Ubuntu. Um, there are, in fact, BSD package, you know, BSD, um, the BSD thing, I think again. There's a BSD build system. Huh? Ports, that's it. Yeah, there's a BSD ports thing with EFL in it. Gen 2 have an e-build for it. Um, it's, it's there and actually by default in several distributions as well, like 30. Um, you can go get the source, download Tarball. You can go get the source from SVN. Um, there is, in fact, a script that does this stuff for you called EZE17.sh and it just magically checks things out and does updates and builds things and you know, handles all of the grunt work for you. It even gives you a nice little console UI with full progress files and stuff. Um, it's actually quite well done. So one of the core libraries behind DFL that ties a lot of the main loop together is called eCore. It is your usual event loop library. Um, it also glues in rendering from Evis. Evis was designed originally to be actually very agnostic. So it could be used by GTK, by Qt. It actually had no toolkit dependencies at all. It was very raw and intended that way so you could glue it in to an existing widget set. Um, so you could suddenly put a canvas there in place of a widget and presto, Evis will go handle the rendering for you. Um, Although nobody ever took any advantage of that or did it. Um, so one of the things that eCore did, it glued in Evis into the main loop. So somewhere during your main loop, I just before you go idle and wait for something else to happen, Evis goes and renders the update of the world. Um, and when it goes up, it doesn't necessarily actually render it. It may do nothing at all if nothing has changed. Um, eCore, as it's the main loop, most of the main loops handle your application state. I, what's currently going on, um, at what state in your main loop or your setup are you, etc. That's what your main loop normally handles. Um, it also handles all the extra little tasks you have to do in your main loop that are generally non-blocking and won't hurt your performance. There is a lot of support for doing threads, even though ESL itself isn't actually thread safe. Um, the idea is that a bit like Grand Central Dispatch in OS X. We have wor thread worker pools and queues and everything else um, to try and not overload your CPU with too many threads, um, but to queue up work and to let your main loop know when that work is done. Um, so then your main loop can reflect the results of that computation or that work done in the thread in your UI. There is also support for threads being able to wait for the main loop to have a slot to be able to do something um, and then quickly lock, in, lock into the main loop and do some work and come back um, without blocking the main loop while you're doing your work in the thread other than just the updates. And there's quite a lot of documentation as to how this all works online. 
the main loop pretty much looks like that, uh, your boring block diagram. Um, it's either sleeping or spinning, um, depending if you have idlers or not. Um, and it wakes up, handles, timeouts, events, deferred jobs, and then just before it goes to sleep, it goes and does the rendering and asks Evis, please go render. Equal Evis is in charge of all this gluing input events and rendering and output to where it's meant to go. So to keep a smooth UI, to make sure it doesn't sit there and look like a choppy mess, put all your I.O. work or heavy computation into a thread. You can actually use asynchronous I.O. as well. Um, there are, in fact, libraries like Equalcon for doing TCP, UDP um, connections and Unix socket connections all asynchronously for you in an evented API, so you don't ever have to block. Using these constructs means it saves you time implementing your own and makes your application actually work better. Um, if you do this, it means your main loop keeps a consistent state of your application altogether. It doesn't have things spread out amongst all sorts of threads, each one playing with some other part of the application, and at which point it's very hard to know your actual current state. So it organizes your application better if you do it this way. It also means that all your changes to the UI get delivered in batches. So you effectively are running through the main loop, changing bits of your UI, and you don't actually see those changes until you finish doing them all and you're about to go idle, and then they get rendered. Um, so it means you actually have a smoother update to UI. You don't see little bits being rendered here and there. If you use animators, not timers, it means that all your animation goes together. Everything that animates runs at the same frame rate. All the changes to everything in your UI are done together at the same time. So all the elements you have that move around, they move together rather than disjoint. Um, so that actually leads to higher frame rates and nicer animation. And don't do any real big work in the main loop. That will hurt you. So with threading, the thread jobs can be queued up. Um, this is done automatically for you when you create an equal thread, and they just get shoveled off to thread workers that deal with it as they become available. Your main loop gets told what has happened. Writing applications or code for ESL is pretty easy. That is, well, I guess, a fairly minimal program that creates a window. Um, but that's all it does at that point. If we add that bit of code, we handle when an application is asked to exit, either the window is being deleted, and at this point, Elm exit exits the main loop, and therefore the application exits as nothing happens after Elm run. By adding a box into the window, we add the ability to pack things vertically. Um, this is a vertical box by default. You can make it horizontal if you want. It just adds a layer, a bit of text in there that says hello world. Then if we add the button, that says OK. And if all you say and do is when it's clicked, you simply call the on OK function and presto, you also exit the application. It's really that easy. It's just a lot of gluing together widgets and state. And compiling it also is not really that hard. Of course. You would, have, you would probably be using proper make files and other build setups of some sort, but a quick dirty one on the command line is really, really easy. You can also implement that same application in something like Elevate, which is not hard. Um, you just declare the UI because it uses a more declarative setup, and the functionality is all owned in the click, whoops, in the click handler down there, and it by default actually handles window delete for you. You don't have to do anything. And running it's really easy to. So if you want to make an application that is more than just boring, boring boxes and buttons, it also isn't very hard either. So just create a window if you get deleted. Here I added a custom background to this window. I right, please just put this plant in the background. I added a vertical box to pack in a flip widget, and a flip widget is in charge of flipping its contents around, a button that, when you click, 
actually goes and flips the flip um, and put that in as a, the resize object for the window. Add in a bunch of text into the flip that says, hello the world. I then add another widget into the flip, a list, which at this point is there in the flip, but it's on the other side, so you can't see it. And when your code is done, you end up with something like this. Whoops. Let me click flip. And actually, if I could catch that list while it's moving, you can actually go and drag it around even while it's being flipped around. Um, and events naturally will work correctly. Evis is a scene graph. This, one, this tracks all the states of a window or multiple windows. You can have sub canvases by using image objects. Um, it handles position size, color, source of images, other text content, etc., etc., and just tracks all of that state. It also handles rendering of all the objects. Um, it may redirect that rendering via any engine that has been implemented. As such, we have about 15 different engines actually written. Um, it also handles loading of resources. So it will defer resource loading until the absolute last minute um, to avoid doing useless work if it can. Um, so that includes fonts, images, and everything else. The advantage of this too is that if you have a resource that you happen to have loaded at some point and you don't need it for a while, Evis can actually go and unload that from memory. I free it because it knows where the source of that data is. It knows that if it ever needs that data again, it just goes back to disk and decodes that image. It has the freedom to do that, which means it can actually try and maintain a very low memory footprint if it wants to. Um, it is completely up to Evis how it implements that, but it also implements caching in the same way. Um, so it knows where the data is on disk. Um, so if you load the same resource a second time, it already has it in memory, and it doesn't even go to disk. It just sits there and goes, oh, same thing. It just hands you the stuff already sitting there. That includes both the image data and textures and fonts and everything else. Um, it tries to minimize the amount of rendering it does, um, so it only updates what it needs to update, and it tries to reduce everything into a knot um, if it can. It will do all the abstraction. Um, there is even a direct 3D engine. There are Windows, Win32, WinCE, um, X11 engines. Um, there is, in fact, also support for Wayland in Evis as well now, both via shared memory and via OpenGL ES as well. Since it's a scene graph and you are not implementing your own rendering functions, you obviously need a way to create your own objects because the basic objects are only going to go so far. And it supports this via smart objects. Smart objects are effectively parent containers for children. And doing this, you can create a single object that just holds a whole bunch of children, just like you might go to Illustrator or Inkscape and group a bunch of objects together and then work on the object as a whole. Um, this effectively creates a parent-child relationship within the scene graph and gives you a tree. Um, so this widget tree is actually what's used in elementary. Um, and elementary does exactly this to build all of its widgets um, using even other libraries like Edge to use this too. Evis also handles figuring out where events go. If you click on something with your mouse or you touch it with your finger, when you press a key or a button, it figures out where to send this event. Sending the event, as far as Evis concerned, actually means calling a callback on the target um, by where the event was directed to. It actually allows you to direct the event at more than one place, so it can actually continue to multiple targets. One of the things it also handles is text formatting. So originally when I was doing um, an application called ESM, a file manager, um, I was literally making interfaces like this. Um, they of course had nice little alpha blended icons and nice fancy text and blah, 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 blah. Um, but they effectively were like a file manager. And a thing graph is really good at doing this kind of stuff. 
um, it makes life very, very easy. So a lot of scene graphs have content that looks very much like that. Um, web pages often look like this as well. Um, it's very, very common. And you can actually build anything from any set of objects. So if you just layer and place them on top of each other and arrange them correctly, you can take a base object, you can stick some text on top, you can stick another object for a bit of lighting and shininess, if you so want that, and some more lighting and shininess on top of that. When you put it all together, you actually have a widget um, in which you can change the text and only the area where the text is gets re-rendered and any objects that are on top that add shading or lighting or shadowing actually add shadowing on top of the text as you change it. Um, so it just magically works. You can contain this into a single parent object. If you do enough of it, you end up with something like that. Um, you can implement a whole UI with all the features and bits and pieces. Um, it's not that difficult. It's just lots and lots of piecing things together. So when Evis abstracts the rendering, Evis itself keeps the whole canvas in its memory. It figures out where everything is. Um, when it renders, it decides where to send the rendering um, to the its chosen engine. As I said before, we've implemented several engines. Um, we've got about 15 of them. But the main ones that people use are software-based engines. And so soft all software-based engines have exactly the same software generic core. And the only difference is where do they send pixels when they're done. So for Wayland, they just will dump pixels in a big shared memory buffer. For X, they will dump pixels in another MIT SHM shared memory buffer and send them up to X. For the frame buffer, it will dump pixels straight to actually dev FB. Um, so ESL actually works straight in the frame buffer as is, including mouse and keyboard support and everything else, um, without actually any changes. So it also may use a different engine like OpenGL, at which point it will upload textures, generate vertices, um, send off those vertices to the actual GPU, go and create GLSL shaders and choose which ones to use, etc., etc. So when Evis actually has to update, and we have something that looks like that, and if we want to move that rectangle down and the cloud moving across behind something else, Evis actually works out what changed those areas, only re-renders those updates if it can, and then you have your final result. And every time you change the state of your canvas, Evis is just tracking the state of an object. It doesn't actually go do the rendering, it just goes, okay, this object now is red. This object's x, y position is now this. And only when it goes down to going idle at render time does it evaluate that state and figure out what changed since the last time it rendered. The pure software path works everywhere. Um, it has plain C code, so if you have some really bizarre architecture, which we don't have any assembly for, it will still work, and it's actually had a lot of effort gone in to make it decently fast. It has MMX, SSE, SC3 support, actually, thanks to an, an Intel guy who sent in the SSC3. Um, there's Neon assembly as well for ARM, um, and all of these are runtime detected, so if your CPU happens to have that feature at runtime, it will be enabled. Um, there's no need to specifically build it for that. Um, so you just, it builds with every support. And then at runtime, oh dear, it's a 386. I guess I won't be using MMX, shall I? Um, et cetera. Um, all its scaling by default, unless you turn smooth scaling off, is actually very, very high quality, much higher quality than OpenGL does. So when you scale down, it actually does full region super sampling. Um, so if you take a 1,000 by 1,000 image and scale it down to 2 by 2 pixels, each of those pixels will actually sample a 500 by 500 pixel area and to generate that one output. Um, and it'll do the, it does this on the fly as it goes. So if it's do, as it's doing this dynamically, just keep in mind that smooth scaling has a cost, but it does look really, really nice. But to speed this up, the software engine has this little thing called scale cache. So if it goes and rescales an image more than a certain number of times, it actually just goes and keeps the scale copy, deciding that keeping the copy is less work than redoing it every single time. Keeping a copy is actually extra overhead than doing it directly to the buffer, so it does have to make that decision. Um, but that does actually speed a lot of very common things up, a lot. 
It also handles 90 degree rotations and other stuff like that, so you can rotate your screen by 90 degrees, you know, like it'll handle the device, etc. The OpenGL ES or OpenGL engine, it does both, um, also tries to optimize by making certain assumptions. Its assumptions are that OpenGL is optimized for games, it's not optimized for anything else. So pretend you're Quake. If you're Quake, you'll do well with OpenGL. If you're not, you're going to have a hard day. So in many cases, as much as it can, it pretends it's a game. It uses texture atlases, which is basically a way of creating one really, really big texture and putting all your things inside the same texture to avoid changing GL state when rendering when it can. Um, it defers texture uploads until it really needs a texture. It actually does out-of-order rendering, just like CPUs can do out-of-order processing. Um, it figures out objects or things it's going to render that don't overlap and reorders them so it batches them into the same texture IDs, the same shader programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, to minimize state changes and keep as much of the pipeline as full as possible. Um, it has very, very simple specialized shaders. I have actually done a lot of performance testing and I have found that if you have a shader and you remove the code that does the color multiplication, i.e. the GL modulation, if you take out that multiply, you do actually get a speed up. Um, it is actually faster avoiding the multiplication. So you might think that you're actually memory bandwidth down, it's actually amazing you're not. You do actually spend cycles. You might get a good 15, 20% speed up by not doing that. So Evis avoids having shaders that do these operations if it doesn't need to do them, i.e. if you're not fading something out or recoloring it, it just doesn't do that operation um, whenever it can. It actually puts as much rendering as feasible possible into GL. It doesn't just use OpenGL as a dumb, big, fat surface compositor. It uses it to render textures. It actually renders polygons via it. So all the text, every little character is actually a little two triangles, and all the text actually is a big list of triangles that go up on screen. Um, so it uses OpenGL to do as much as possible. Unfortunately, on some GPUs, like actually the Intel GMA3150, it doesn't have a vertex shader um, in hardware. So this unfortunately leads to poor performance on that particular GPU. Um, it's kind of a very weird spot. It has a fragment shader, but no vertex shader. It actually also has support for extensions that get rid of texture uploading um, that mean you actually have direct access to the actual texture memory itself. Um, and it actually supports doing that. So this is very useful for quote, quote, application generated pixels. Um, it said, OpenGL and X11, it actually has XCB code as well for XCB, X11 rendering. Wayland, OpenGL and shared memory. Raw frame buffers, DevSB on Linux. Memory buffers, we have have PlayStation 3 support. The actual, this is not Linux on PlayStation 3, it's actual real native PlayStation 3. Um, SDL, um, Windows, WinC32, and others as well. There's even a direct SD one. It supports lots of images for um, decoding. Uh, lots and lots of those formats. Um, whatever free type supports for fonts. All text it deals with is UTF-8 Unicode. Um, it does support complex text rendering. So for those who want things like Hindi support or Arabic, Hebrew, blah, 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 all that quote, quote, complex and weird text support. Um, weird, at least, from Westerner. It is all supported. Edge does layout of objects. It's basically a way of creating a smart object by saying, here's a file, go load all your sub-objects there and figure out how it actually lays out and renders so I don't have to know or care. And some other designer can go and create that data file. You can replace that data file at runtime and change the look and feel of your application very, very easily. Edge files are uh, eat files. It means that they are cached. They are binary blobs. They're meant to be interpreted by the CPU, not by a human being. Unlike things like XML, JSON, etc., there's no parsing involved. It simply walks through an object tree in memory and instantiates that the actual data structure. Um, it is tagged, so it is actually portable and expandable over time. So this tree, this data structure stored in that file, it actually just defines, here's a bunch of objects, here's a layout relative to each other, and 
a bunch of states so you can transition states, etc., etc. You'll actually see if you look at QML, um, QML looks very much like Edge. It actually, the guy, the QML guys actually looked at something called QEdge, and QEdge is something that actually was a port of Edge to Qt. Um, so you'll see very, very close similarities between them. Um, they definitely looked at many things in, in Edge um, to borrow ideas. Because these files are not text, it doesn't have to be parsed, like text has to be. It um, doesn't have to handle syntax error and syntax checking, etc., etc. Um, they're very small and fast and compact. Um, they're very, very fast. In fact, every single bit of my UI you see on my screen, that's right, everything is sourced from an Edge file and loaded on demand when it needs to be loaded, decoded, and instantiated in memory on the fly. And it actually works incredibly quickly. How do you create those files? Create the Edge files? Yeah. There's a compiler, Edge CC. There's a compiler. You take a text file and it, but it parses the text file, so it actually does parsing then, and in memory you have a data structure, and it just, you say, eat this data structure. The, this is how it looks. So it's this many bytes, a size of struct, and at element x is an int, element y is a double, element this is a char star, element this is an int, element this is a char, element this is a pointer to a linked list. And this is how we handle linked list. And this linked list is a linked list of this struct. And that struct has, again, all these sub-elements. It can do linked list, hash tables, um, arrays, variable and fixed size arrays. Um, and then all the basic normal C data types, as well as strings. And it basically takes that data structure and it turns it into a blob. And that binary blob is a portable tag base, so each element actually has a name tag. So and a type. the source code for that uh, compiler? Oh, in Edge, in, in source bin. Yeah, EDC. That's a text file. What are you typing there? What? Uh, I'll I'll get to that. <laughs> I'll just wait. Wait a second. Um, so it handles all those rules, and in memory, when this is all there, it just follows the rules as to what the layout is, um, and events, and when an event happens, it may transition things from one thing to the other. Um, and as a byproduct, it also ends up being an entire theme engine or the core of a theme engine. So. An application, I'll be getting to it in just a sec. Um, applications deal with Edge by either sending or receiving signals, sending or receiving messages. Messages are structured signals that allow you to send lists of integers, lists of floating point things, string lists, etc. where signals and cells are just basic string pairs, two strings. Um, you'll get callbacks when Edge triggers a signal for you, so you can register a callback. Saying, when this signal happens, call this. Um, you can set text saying, by the way, the element name this, the text should be this, whatever it is. So that's how you can update labels, etc. Um, you can say, hey, in element X, I've got this object and I wish you to manage this object. I swallow this object for me. At which point you provide it with an object and Edge will go, okay, I'll manage that for you. It swallows it into its tree and it becomes part of your Edge object. By doing this, you can contain a one Edge object in another Edge object, in another widget, in another button, in another object, all the way down the tree. And it actually just works. Um, Ever deals with, oh sorry, Edge deals with talking to Ever for you for most of this and dealing with the main loop for animation and looking at the Edge file. This is what you want. This is a very, very simple EDC file. Yes, it looks very wordy, but it is in fact very, very simple. It's, it looks a lot, if you're a C programmer, like you're declaring a C data structure. You're saying, I have a struct and there's a group in it and it has a name field, it's a string, blah, 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 blah. Um, the HCC is a really, really dirt, simple parser. It has not very intelligent at all, um, but it wasn't intended to be very intelligent because it doesn't need to have a lot of fancy features and it doesn't need to have good performance because this is done before it actually hits a real device um, or real life when you use it day to day. So you compile that and you just say, hey, I've got this plant in the background. I wish to have an aspect ratio, minimum, maximum aspect ratio of one, I square. Um, you can give it a preference by which axis controls um, the aspect ratio. That's just the default state. States have a name and a value. The reason they have a value is you can have a state with the same name but multiple values. And if you say, please, if you have, let's say, four values, 0 0.0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, oh, and 1, 
and you set it to 0 0.6, it'll choose the closest value, right? 0 0.5, it'll figure out what the closest one is. So you can use that to, for example, create n states for something like a little dial that has like 20 different positions and it'll find the closest appropriate one for you. Or you can explicitly name your states, in which case you always just use zero. Um, I added some text on top, just says hello world, says font, and there's even a shadow object on top. Um, so, and that you compile, so when you compile that, um, you just do something like edge cc hello.edc. Oh, we shut it at PNG. Oh, I didn't put shadow to PNG. Well, let me go find the shadow. Ah, right, here we go. Ooh. I forgot to turn that on. Okay. okay, there we go. So I didn't have a shadow there. Just compile it. If you you can give it, make it verbose. And then it tells you all the elements it put in. You can can you read that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and you know basically what it put in. It actually can do audio as well. You can add sounds and stuff. That's kind of a new feature. We don't trump it much because we're not happy with it yet. Um, and basically all the size of it. So and there's a little utility included to play with these things. And on a hello dot edj. Oh, that shadow thing. Okay, I don't want that shadow file. Um, I want to have... Okay, maybe I want one. Oh, okay, that was a bad idea. Now I've destroyed it. No, I, I forgot the to put the shadow file in there that I originally used. Um, um, I, had, I recycled uh, the, the example. Okay, now I have the right, the right shadow thing. Da, 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 da. And if you, this is an okay. Here we go. That's what I wanted. So now we we just have a window with the example in there. You can see there's a plant in the background, but you'll probably notice some interesting things. Of course, those parameters when I laid it out, you'll see that as I move, the aspect ratio of the background is kept, but it will because I've said none, it'll actually extend it and clip beyond the boundaries. You'll notice that the shadow actually scales to the window, but the text remains in the middle, um, exactly the same. So just by setting up some rules, you can do anything like this and all sorts of interesting variations. Do this enough and you can create almost any UI you can think of um, just by setting up a few rules. So you can end up, again, all those different... Can you saw the, uh, yep. the, the output? The, the, what, what, what the output? Yeah. This? Oh, so that's just... The output. Oh, the output is hello dot edj. That file. Yeah, but what's in there? Oh, in, okay. Inside that file yeah. can, well, in this case, is the layout information, the actual image data itself, so both the images. Is the binary blob? Yeah. Oh well, it is a binary blob, but you can go and inspect the blob. It is not totally transparent. One, it's all open source. Two, it actually has all these entries. So think of it as like a zip file a zip file with different keys. And each of those keys will have thing. That image thing is actually image data. It's actually gone and stuck an image, inlined it into the file. Um, there's actually got two images there. There's, uh, well, the font map tells you the font mapping like to external fonts. You can inline fonts as well. Um, the sources actually contains the original EDC data. So you can actually do, uh, actually, let me go and, Change the there we go. Is that better for everybody? Um, 
So edge DCC is a decompiler. So you can just go and decompile it. So it's gone and taken everything out of the file again and given you back your source data. So the images, the plant, the shadow, um, the hello EDC, and even the build build script to go and build it together again. So it's fine. Um, but that file contains that. So the edge file is just like a header. That the edge slash file just is a header that tells you this is an edge file and here's a bunch of index information. The collection zero is that particular group that's there. Um, so when we declared this, there's that collections and there's one group. So there's only one of them. So all that stuff is stuffed into the file. You can put fonts there, images, audio. Um, it'll just go all put it in that single file. So you just drop in that one file and Edge itself will, at runtime, just go and source the bits of that file, let it need as it needs them um, on the fly. It also includes, Edge actually has a nice cache system to avoid um, re-going to disk if it doesn't actually have to. So that's what's in there. You can also do scaling. So the same text has been marked to scale. And so when you do that, everything can remain the same, but the text can go and change size as well. Um, you can actually mark any element to scale, not just text. You can mark other images, objects, and blah, blah, blah. So by a marking scale, they'll be adjusted when the scaling comes. Elementary glued this all together in a widget set. Um, it's built on top of the other layers of EFL. It has most of the widgets you'd ever need. If you don't have a widget, you can actually implement your own smart objects relatively easily in Evis. Um, you generally don't tend to need to do that most of the vast majority of the time. So common things, button, checkboxes, lists, blah, 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 blah. Um, it unifies theme setup with a policy as to how themes are handled, where edge files should be stored, what they should be named, how you can have a priority fallback system. I try this theme file. If it's not in there, try the next one, the next one, and drop down until you find it. It also caches the results of that. Um, it just saves work for the developer, makes it easier. Um, it's all built around scaling and adjusting to correct finger sizes. Um, you can mix and match widgets and other low-level objects. So you can take a widget and then just go and rotate it around and have fun with it. In fact, I have a nice little example. And here is one I prepared earlier. Uh -huh. So test. And you can just take a button and just make it go and rotate like that. And it actually will work. And even as it's rotating, it'll still work. So even all widgets. Widgets are just other objects you can go and play with at will, um, like anything else. And you can mix and match this with just low-level images and everything else. So imagine you're making a game in which you have lots of game characters and trees and monsters and stuff. You can actually just stick buttons and checkboxes in the middle of your game world, and they actually will work correctly, uh, magically. Uh, everything's magic these days. Um, so that's what I mean by widgets can be transformed like any other object. Yes. Ah, yeah. Um, so it, it glues in with the input method handling, um, and it does lots of other stuff to save you time. Um, of course, everything gets rendered via the chosen engine. Um, it enforces things like finger size. Works on both desktop and touch screen. So when you're on touch screen. You just go and drag with your finger. You change mode to desktop and get a little scroll bar and you drag via that. Um, you don't have to unmodify the application at all to make that work. So theming, you can change the look. Um, scaling, widgets can be scaled happily up and down. Um, emotion, does video, um, glues things together. Uh, it's very easy. Adding an emotion object, that's all you need. Create object, init, set file, size. Um, it sources the video for you, does all the threading, threaded decoding, glues it into the actual surface, you know, the um, image surfaces, YUV, um, acceleration via OpenGL um, for YUV, or software and decode. EAT is the core of EDGE. That's what actually does the data structure encoding and decoding. Um, it's basically JSON or XML for C programmers. Um, so it makes it really easy one-liners. So you take a structure like that, you create a class, you tell it, 
what your members are. So you've got a double here, an int there, and so on. And it's really open, open files, write, and close. It's that simple. Um, and you can decode in the exact reverse. My dial structure equals that. And you get a whole data structure tree, everything allocated in memory. You can actually go and decode the data structures straight from the file and actually get some text representation from them as well and actually re-import. Um, so it's very easy to do that, so to re-import them. And there's lots of other libraries as well to do all sorts of useful things that I really don't have time to cover. <laughs> I'm lucky I got about right. Um, so there's a lot more. Um, I can't mention it all here, but there's a lot of useful things around. So do some research, ask questions, poke around, and see how it wobbles. Questions and answers. Oh, so is GNOME Shell and so is KDE. Agreed. And yeah. you say, what about the, the obviously uh, Samsung relevant case of uh, surface plane? Completely different operating systems, not even comparable. Yeah. And, uh, Android, surface swing in, totally different operating system, 100% different display system. So at least both Unity, GNOME Shell, and KDE all share the same display server. It's a share the same display system. They even share the same app setup, the same methods of compositing. They're stuck to the same thing. No, because Surface Slinger doesn't include a desktop. You don't have, Surface Slinger itself does not have desktop, don't have a launcher, does not have all these bits and pieces. It's not actually comparable. Um, it is not, it's comparing apples and monkeys. Um, you're comparing two very different things. We, we can sit here and compare, yes, but it's comparing very fundamentally different things other than they both are compositing display servers. And in fact, Enlightenment isn't a, in Surface Slinger is a compositing display server. It's more, you can more compare Surface Slinger and Wayland or Western, actually Western, than you compare Enlightenment because Western has no features other than doing the compositing and display and a bit of management, which is much closer to what Surface Slinger is. I haven't, I don't know, but you can find lots of comparisons of, let's say, Unity and GTK and Q, <laughs> and you can take that and compare. Um, but I know GTK much better than I know Q, so therefore I do more comparisons there. Um, I've actually worked on GTK before. So. Lose. Lost bloat. <laughs> you don't have to throw it away. You just don't waste resources. You only load what you need when you need it. When you no longer need it, you get rid of it. Um, you only keep things in memory when you need them. Memory map stuff when you can memory map it as opposed to allocating it in memory. Don't parse stuff when you don't need to parse stuff. Mm -hmm. I, parsing text files is actually slow. Okay. Yeah. What is the key point for your and Only do what you need to do when you need to do it. And then actually spend time and actually profile your code, profile your memory usage. Don't sit here and think, I've got 4 gig of RAM, I don't care. That's actually a very, okay, if you look at what a lot of people were saying for the last 10 years, like, I don't worry how much memory users, we'll just double our memory next year. We're going to have twice as much memory, our CPU is going to be twice as fast, who cares? Hardware will catch up. And my attitude has been, don't wait for hardware to catch up, because eventually it's going to hit a wall, eventually it won't. And it's better to have something that works now than wait a year until hardware catches up. But a lot of attitude in the software industry has, over the last 10 years, been, I just wait for hardware to catch up. It's actually more an attitude thing rather than a technical thing. You take the attitude of, don't wait for hardware to catch up. It actually matters. Profiling matters. Do actually use tools like memprof. Actually profile where your memory is, or um, use the Valgrind's massive stuff. Find out where your memory goes, know why it goes there. Um, and if you don't need it, get rid of it. Um, and actually spend a lot of time looking at it. So. Yeah. Anyway, fun? Oh. It's not directly ESL related, but I'm just wondering how do you split up your time between maintaining and enhancing ESL and working directly on Samsung commercial products? 
that's kind of hard because EFL is, okay, none of the stuff we're doing in Tizen now is actually out in a commercial product. Seeing I work on the research and development side of actually making the platform, and a platform needs EFL, all my work on EFL actually is for the platform. So it just directly is straight in that pipeline. So it really is one and the same thing. Yeah. Uh, of course, on a slight sideline, there are things I might want to like to have in EFL and I think are a good idea that are not directly related to any immediate products. But generally speaking, I have a reason. I, you're not going to do it this year, but in two or three years' time, you're going to need that feature. So I might want to add it now and play with it and make it work, get it mature, let it settle, and then in two or three years, you'll go and use it. So invariably it is, but it's not an immediate need. It's a you know, long-term future. If we don't need it, I'm not going to go spend time on it because I've got so much to do anyway. So, yeah. Done? Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>